uh, the data so it knows where we are. All right, so I might lie to the geolocation plugin. So let me look. gives me an error. Probably because it cannot find the location. So I'm going to fudge and I'm going to put in that regardless of what it finds, regardless of what the geolocation plugin finds, oh this is weird. Regardless of what the geolocation plugin finds, I am going to, I know what I did, I forgot to copy an include file. Or no, I do have that. I'm going to say, set my search term to Cleveland, Ohio. All right, undefined offset in line 76. All right, and here we have our news summary from Cleveland, which you're not seeing. So we will take a look at it. The assignment that I had last time involved taking the geolocation plugin that we had previously and incorporating that with this example I found from Yahoo. So if we look at this, oops. The example that I had, if you click on that, this example pulled news stories concerning climate change. All right? And it outputted some HTML based on um, what it finds from out of, of Yahoo News. It should be pretty clear that this search term is what we want to change if we want to pull news about some other topic, specifically if we want to pull news from uh, a localization. So, if we just look at this, it should be pretty clear that we need to plug city into that. Well, where do we get the city from? If we look at the geolocation plugin, all right, pardon me? There's city and region, I think. Region, I, I think, was the state. Yeah, and city was uh, the city, of course. So, if we could go and we can concatenate the region 
or the city and the region together, then we'll look for Cleveland OH. As opposed to Cleveland what? There's a Cleveland, Mississippi, I think? Or Cleveland somewhere. All right. Um, I, I know I ran into that when I was testing this at home because I did searches, my, my location was Amherst, so it was pulling up a lot of stories about Amherst, Massachusetts, and it's like, oh, okay, I better tack the region onto it. So, so the idea is, is we want to take these two things and replace them, replace that search uh, for that. So what I came up with looks like this then. Includes a geolocation plugin, include file. We do that to fire everything off and to start the geolocation. We then, actually in this example I'm just pulling the city, but you could concatenate the region uh, onto it as well and say something like plus, comma, plus GL plugin city, I'm sorry, region. And now everything should work okay. All right, because our search term is set. When it showed climate control, it showed us everything about climate control. So if we change that to our location, it should show about our, show about our location. And sure enough, it will, again. Because this is running on a server um, that, that is not really on the internet, it can't do the geolocation. Since I'm running off my local server, I'm not going through the ISP. Therefore, I hard-coded in Cleveland, Ohio to get it work here. But if we were able to put this up on a server and go and request it, we'd just remove that line and it would go and find the search. So the nice thing is, with some of these plugins, is they're easy enough to use even if you don't understand all the details. All right. We want to take that a little bit further though today and we want to look a little bit at the coding that's being done here. Um, because we don't want to be at the mercy of what it did for us. All right. We want to be able to uh, be flexible to maybe format the output in a different way or, or whatever. All right. So we're going to spend some time making sure we understand this and we didn't just substitute that. I will admit though, there's been plenty of times when I've been using like a service like this where you learn just enough of it to get the results that you want. And <laughs> there's some value to that. But we want to do more. We want to go beyond that. So that's why we're going to spend some time looking for that. Alright? So the first thing that you notice is that this guy calls a function called PIPHP get Yahoo News and it passes as an argument the search string which again was climate change or our location. That function is down here. Alright. Now this function eventually is going to return an array. All right? It's actually going to return a couple of arrays. All right? Or actually, I'm sorry, it's, it's going to return an array, but then it's also going to return the count of. It's going to return an array that contains the count of the number of elements and the array itself, which is kind of goofy. We don't really need to do that. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll refactor this a little bit as we're working through this. At any rate, let's see how it gets it. Well, first of all, it sets up the reports as an empty array. These next two lines are critical because this is what actually goes out and accesses that information. All right? goes in and accesses the information from Yahoo's news service. And if you notice, you'll notice a couple things. First of all, let's look at the URL that we're requesting.
The URL is an RSS feed. Is anyone familiar with RSS feeds and what they're used for? I've heard about a half dozen different explanations about what the, what the letters stand for. Uh, and who knows which one's true. In a nutshell, what this is, is this is a standard way of showing the most recent updates to a particular site. All right. A lot of times it's used with blogs and a lot of times people who have RSS readers um, so that they don't have to go to and visit every blog that they're interested in. They can define, like Google News was an example of this, which is, is soon to, to go defunct, but there's other RSS readers where you could define which feeds you're interested in and it will show you a list of, say, the top ten most recent news stories from each of those feeds and then you could go and look up the, the stories that you're more interested in. So it's a nice way to sort of aggregate things. And it's pretty standard too. A lot of blogging software, Facebook, a lot of social media uses RSS as a way of showing updates. So it's, it's valuable to know this for integration. Um, I worked on some mobile sites and again, all we did was take the RSS feeds off of Facebook in one case, in another case I think it was a WordPress blog, and put that, wrap that in a mobile wrapper and essentially have a mobile application. And the beauty of that is, is when the site is updated, the mobile application gets the update as well. So it's a nice way to, to sort of, to, to, to get things fairly easily. Let's put this URL up in an address bar and see what we get. Oh, they're not going to let us do that. Unless, maybe we have to supply some of the extra parameters. Because the rest of the parameters is here, or are here. And I'll put in here as the P, which is the term that's being searched for, I'll put in Cleveland. All right, look what we get. We get an XML file, and that's what RSS is. It's an XML file. What is an XML file? An XML file is a standardized way of exchanging data between applications. It can be used for other things, certainly, but that's certainly one of the most popular ways of doing it. What... Um, HTML is very similar to HTML in the sense that it uses tags to describe the data that this has. For example, at the top there is RSS indicating that this is an RSS document. All right. There is a channel with the title and a description and some other things. Then if you notice, there's a collection of items. And each of these items would represent a news story. Nice thing is, is when you view an XML file in a browser, you can expand or contract the item. So here we see that this has a series of items in it. And we can expand one to see all the stuff that's underneath it. So the title of the article is this. The link to the full article is this. This tells us if it's a permalink or not. A permalink would be a link that would, uh, even over time, changes. That link would still apply. And then there's a description of the story. And so on down the line. Here's uh, the next story. There's a title and all that. 
So when we request this, we get some XML. We get a chunk of XML. Now, that XML we can't directly do anything with. We have to take it and we have to sort of parse it. We have to break it down into its pieces and, and pluck out the pieces that we're interested in. Because in any XML file, all right, there's liable to be stuff that we're interested in and stuff that we're not interested in. All right. So it just comes across as data. This is a great example of separating the content from the pres presentation. The XML document, in this case the RSS feed, contains the news stories. But there's no formatting. There's nothing that says how this is going to be formatted on a page. This could be put into divs. This could be put into paragraphs. We could create hyperlinks with things. We could do any number of things. There's nothing in here that says how that is. This is strictly the content. It's our job as the, as the folks that are processing this XML feed, or the star has feed rather, in the XML file to go and handle this. Now here's the nice thing. If you write one of these, because RSS is a standard, you could easily go and adapt it for other RSS feeds. All right? So what we're doing here, you could likely do with other RSS feeds if you find them. So if you find, you know, I don't know, uh, a blog that has an RSS feed and you want to incorporate that into your PHP page, you could follow this. The only difference would be the particular URL that you'd request. So getting back to this, if we look here, this is forming the URL that we want. This is where we want to get the data from. And if you notice, it's not on our server. It's via HTTP. So it will go out to the web, make an HTTP request, and it will pull the contents of that file into this XML string. All right. So when we're done, when these two instructions are done, that XML string is going to have all of this stuff in it. All of this stuff in it. Now, that's not going to do us any good. We have to do something with it. We have to process it. But this will pull it. This is, by the way, a synchronous request as opposed to an asynchronous request. Just kind of file that piece of information in the back of your mind because uh, we'll be talking about Ajax, so we're going to be doing something very similar to this, except we're going to make an asynchronous request as opposed to a synchronous request. So, we define the URL that we want our data from. We say get contents of this file, and it's able to. We could do this actually to one of our local files if we wanted to, but in this case, we don't want it from one of our local files. We want it from this RSS feed of Yahoo's. So if we make the URL have the HTTP and follow the proper syntax, we'll can, we can go out to that service and get the RSS feed. Couple things I want to note. First of all, raw URL encode. All right? Certain characters mean certain things all right, within a URL. All right? Slashes mean something. Ampersands mean something. Uh, what else? Question marks mean something. Spaces mean something. All right. So typically, if you're going to format a URL, you want to make sure that we we don't violate any of the goofy rules. All right. I, I shouldn't say goofy rules. They're not goofy rules, but we want to make sure we don't violate the rules. All right. For example, if there's a space in our URL, this raw URL and code will actually replace it with something like a percent sign 20% or something like that. That's sort of the escaped version. That's an encoded version uh, of that. We can more or less figure that out if we go to 
Yeah, or let's go to Bing. That's the search engine I've used in my 216 examples. If we do a search for Cleveland, Ohio here, you'll notice, well, in this case, it actually converted it by putting a plus sign in between it. All right. The bottom line is you can't have a space in a URL. You can't have an ampersand in a URL. If, for example, I search for B&O Railroad, notice how it encoded that with the percent sign 26. That's escaping out that character. So anytime you're creating a URL and you're providing a portion of that URL, you want to run it through the encoding process. And that's what that's doing here, just in case there's any goofy characters that could cause problems on, in the URL. All right. In this case, we're not really sure what that geolocation plugin is going to give us for the name. All right. So we need to go through and make sure that we encode that data. And that's what the, the highlighted section does. All right. So we have our URL, and that URL is properly encoded, so there's no goofy characters that's going to give us grief. All right? The next statement actually goes and grabs the data from it. Interesting thing, this little at sign in front of it, I, I don't recall ever seeing that before. Does anyone have any idea what that is? Don't feel bad if you don't, because until about like an hour ago, I didn't know what that meant. The at sign in PHP. Essentially, that says, don't worry about any errors that are encountered. So normally, you know, um, if there's errors, you know, you're liable to get like some kind of warning message or some kind of message like that. Well, in this case, for whatever reason, if there's an issue accessing that URL or whatever, you don't want to pop up some kind of ugly error. So we're just saying ignore the errors. We'll handle it differently. All right. So that's what the at sign in front of the function uh, means means the, are there any or, or I'm sorry it means to ignore any errors that could be caused by this. All right, so assuming this is successful, this dollar sign XML variable is going to have this data in it. It's going to have this chunk of XML. So let's see what we do. We do a couple of things to sort of clean up the encoding in that XML file. If you notice, for example, the title and the link and some of the other things are actually in this C data declaration. What that means in an XML file is that's saying effectively this is not XML code. It's telling the, anything that parses XML that that's not XML code. So if you run into any characters that look like XML code in there, ignore it. Don't treat it as XML code. Treat it as just plain characters. All right. So that's what that C data means. In other words, we're telling the XML file, hey, this stuff isn't really XML. It's just a bunch of characters. You don't need to worry about does it follow the rules of XML or anything goofy like that. So one of the things that we do is we strip all those out because we're not really interested in, in that. Likewise, we're replacing the ampersands with an actual ampersand. And we're replacing some of the tags. When we do that, we can take this string and we can create an XML object in it. This XML is just a string. You know, when we do this statement here, we don't know for sure what we're getting back. In this case, we know we're getting XML back. But if I made this 
with another URL, or if I put in another file name, I'm not necessarily going to get back XML. All right, I'm just going to get back a big string. We want to take advantage, though, of the built-in stuff to process XML. The built-in classes within PHP that allow us to parse XML. So therefore, we want to take those plain old characters and treat them like they're XML. And that's effectively what this statement does. This statement takes that string of characters and it makes an HTML object out of it. All right. Simple XML load string. I'm not really sure what the simple designation means, but again, effectively we're converting this. Now in this variable, this variable knows that it's XML. This variable simply knows that it's a string. All right. Because this is XML, I can use all the features, if you will, of XML. I can use all the properties. So, what I can do is, remember we look through, whoops, we look through the RSS data. We said that there was a channel, and the channel contained items, and each item was a news story. So, what this code is saying is in my XML, for every channel, for every item within every channel, loop through. So this is going to loop through effectively one time per item tag that's contained within a channel tag. In other words, it's going to loop through um, through the list of item tags. And again, we can do this because SXML is an XML object. We couldn't do that with plain old XML because plain old XML was simply a string. So we could do string things to XML. We can do XML things to SXML because SXML is an XML object. So now what do we do? We're looping through, and each iteration through the loop, we're going to look at the next tag in turn. Let me rephrase that. We're going to look at the next item tag in turn. That's what this means. For each item, for each, within our XML, within the channel tag, we're going to look at each item tag, and each time through the loop, we're going to call the item tag that we're looking at, we're going to call that tag dollar sign item. All right. Now here's the interesting thing from an XML perspective, right? Each piece of an XML file, I won't say each piece, e each, did I say each peach? Each piece, each piece of an XML file, not necessarily literally every piece, but Pieces of XML files themselves are actually XML data. All right? For example, if we are looking at this item tag, the contents of this item tag is XML data. All right? So it's a tree structure. Uh, a lot of times in computer science they refer to this kind of thing as tree structure, and they talk about trees and nodes and, and branches and all that. All right? If you look at a tree, you know, any branch of a tree looks like a little tree, all right? Just like if we look at a branch within our XML file, it's a little piece of XML. So that means that when we do this and we loop through, for each of these HTML, I'm sorry, for each of these XML tags, each trip through the loop, we're going to call the one that we're looking at dollar sign item. Dollar sign item itself is a piece of XML. So we can do XML things to it. All right. So what do we do to that? What XML things we do? Well, we grab 
the contents of the link tag. We grab the contents of the pub date tag. We grab the contents of the title tag. That's what this represents. Just like this represented the channel tags within our XML document and the item tags within them, this represents the link tag within each item tag. So the first trip through the loop, we're looking at this first item and the link tag is going to be this for the first one. All the way down the line. What do you suppose this code is doing here? This is tricky. Breaking all the items in the section? Uh, not really. This is an intriguing function. Similar text. Pardon me? Is it making sure that there's not the same? It's looking for duplicates, right. In other words, let's go out and Google that PHP. What's the exact name of it? Similar underscore text. This calculates the similarity between two strings as described in programming classics, implementing blah, 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 and so on and so on and so forth. Essentially what this is doing is this is looking to see if the articles are duplicated. All right. If it's 70 percent or more, then it ignores it. All right. It's actually pretty clever. All right. Because yeah, if if uh, Um, losing my train of thought here. Um, yeah, it loops through it. Each time, each trip through the loop, we're adding more and more things to that reports array. Or we're potentially adding more and more things. So let's say the, there's the first time through, of course, there's nothing in there. So of course, there's nothing to compare it up against. So the first time through, count of reports is zero. So it's not going to do that redundancy check. And it will simply add that first news story to the reports array. The second time through, it's going to look at this. And now, reports has one value in it, one element in it. So it's going to compare the second news story with the first news story. And it's either going to add it or not. So this reports array is going to grow. And each time through, any new story that's encountered is going to look through all the things that have been up to that point added in. All right. And again, it uses as a cutoff the 70%. The and if it's more than 70% similar, it considers it duplicated. You know, I mean, you know how news stories go, you know, if, if for example, you know, the, the Cleveland Plain Dealer reports something, uh, the Akron Beacon Journal might report the same article. And it looks like it's two articles because it's from two different sources, you know. And depending on how Yahoo's RSS feed aggregates those, it could look like two different articles. Um, but um, again, you know, um, they're actually the same article. We could probably see the effect of this if we 
you know, got rid of that line of code and never rejected anything. This, by the way, is sort of the same idea between if anyone has used turnitin.com. I don't know, does that ring a bell with anyone? There's a website called turnitin.com for like term papers. My daughter has to turn in uh, her papers there. And what happens is you upload your paper, it will then go and it will look and it will compare the paper that you uploaded with all the papers that have ever been uploaded plus different sources on the internet and so on and so forth. The problem with that is, is that if you do a lot of quoting, it could show like a false positive. It could say, hey, there's a lot of duplication of content here. That's why the instructor can't take it at face value. The instructor has to look into it and see why there's that much in common. Because it could be just innocent quoting. They could, be, they could have cited the material correctly and they're not plagiarizing it. All right. But still, it does something like that. I suspect they probably use a more involved algorithm than this, this function. I'd be really curious you know, now that summer's coming up, maybe I'll, I'll dig up that book and see how that algorithm works that compares to see if the text is similar. I'm surprised schools don't have that in place for teachers. What do you mean? Instead of just handing in a copy of your paper, just send a digital copy. Oh, they, they do at, 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 at the... No, at, in, like as a standard. Oh, yeah. Because it's so simple. Just, just a quick... Right, right. Well, hard to say. Actually, um, we were talking to the folks. This is sort of a di sort of a different thing, but um, same idea. Is that um, my IT lab? Any of you have taken CISS 121 and used my IT lab? I that, but yeah. Yeah, my IT lab. Uh, they actually uh, they have internal stamps in the document. So, for example, you have to download the document off of their server. So when you download it, actually encode it inside the Word document. It's all XML stuff. So encoded within that is something that says you're the person that downloaded it, right? So if you complete the assignment and upload it, then give it to me and I upload it, it will notice, hey, it's the same file because there's like an internal stamp for that. And uh, it is, it's pretty nifty, and it's pretty sophisticated too. Even if you just, even if you like, think you're clever and co and copy and paste, because like you might say, well, hey, you know, I'm going to get clever. Then I'm not going to copy the document. I'm going to make a document and then copy and paste the contents of the document in. It's still able to catch that, which is which is pretty amazing. But a lot of the professors that teach the class uh, don't use that. No, they don't. Because it is such a nightmare because it only knows one path and you may know 50 different ways to do something. Right. But it only knows one well, path. That, that reportedly has changed to a large degree in the new, uh, the, the new version of it um, is web-based and, and well, that would be bad. Yeah, yeah, so. But, uh, so many of the professors have dropped it mm -hmm. because it's been such a nightmare. Right. My daughter had it. She's like, oh man, this is so bad. Who, who's that? My daughter. Oh. I made her take 121 and she's like, mom, my IT lab is killing me. Right. All right. Well, hopefully that's been straight now. At any rate, that isn't the purpose of this discussion. <laughs> it's just kind of a digression. But that's the idea. Each time through the loop, we're looking in, and we're just doing a little filtering out for, um, for uh, redundancy. Now, though, we have effectively a two-dimensional array. We actually have an array of arrays, all right? Because that reports array, each element of that reports array is itself an array. What this indicates, again, is add to the end of that array, this guy, all right? So each element of that reports array is an array that contains those things. So. All we've really done at this point, we haven't outputted anything out to the screen yet. All right. All we've done is we've made our request, we've gotten our XML, we've plucked out of that XML the pieces that we're interested in. Because we may not be interested in everything, but we decided we're interested in those things. And we're also, we also did a little filtering to make sure there's no redundancy. So 
when we're done with this, we should have an array called reports that contains multiple elements, each element of which itself is an array. So essentially the reports is the channel. Yes. And then an array is the item, each item. Yes. Okay. Yes. The reports would correspond to the, the, the all the items in the channel and each element itself would be an item. Okay. Now for some reason that I don't know why, they return another array that contains the count of this array and the array itself. I don't know why they just don't return the array because if you know the array you can get the count of the array. Right? I don't know why this guy has to return it. So at any rate, at this point, <laughs> we have in the results a two element array. <laughs> All right. The first element is simply a count that says how many elements are in, are in the array. The second element is an array of items all right, that we're going to loop through. And again, we look to see if there is no value there is no items in the array. The first element of this results array, which means we found no new stories. You know, if you put in some nonsense search screen, uh, search uh, term or whatever, it would return no new stories. So if that happens, we return that there's no news for that search. Otherwise, we loop through the results array. The results array is actually the second element of the results array. Or the item array is actually the second element of that results array. The first element of that results array is the counter that says how many elements. I don't know why they didn't do just this. Just return the reports array and then do that and it should do the same thing and we get around the fact that the return is actually a two element array first element is a count and the second element is the actual array that we're really interested in let me say that make sure it works maybe I'll put my foot in my mouth seems to have worked. Yeah, seems to have worked. All right. In my mind, it's a lot cleaner code. I, I, that seems goofy to me. Now, here's where we're getting into to a large degree the real work here. All right, because what we're doing is we're formatting the results. All right, and notice what we're doing. We're taking and we're creating a link using the fourth element of that results array, which was the URL. Where, where am I at? The text of which the link is the title. All right, the title of the article. Then we display now element number one, which is the website that it came from. Element number two, which is the date, 
and element number three, which is a description. Here's where you're actually going to mix the HTML formatting with the results from that array. So, maybe I want to do something else. This is why, again, it's, it's, it's good to know this. Maybe I want to put the title in an H2 tag or an H1. Let's put it in an H2 tag. And maybe I want the text of the link to be just the word details. By going and saving that, notice how this looks a lot different. And the link goes to the link page. The thing about this, to, to back up a little bit, the nice thing about this RSS feed is, again, I can go and I can format the results, the contents that I get from this RSS feed any way I want to. Someone else can take that same RSS feed and format it however they want to. It's a very nice separation between presentation and content. Again, we talk about this all the time, whether we're talking about in an intro to web development class, the difference between what we put in an HTML file and what we put in a CSS file. Here we're talking about the same thing. The, the, the RSS is pure content. We're using our PHP to format that content to get it to be the way we want it to be. That has the nice feature then of um, allowing the, the content to come over and then we can format it however we want to and we can make changes to the formatting of it without affecting pulling that content in. All right. So again, this line here you know, I would probably clean this up to make that a div. Get rid of the break tags because break tags are banned. Maybe put like this in a paragraph tag. Nice thing again is you can you can separate this out. If we were clever, if we were going to do this in a lot of cases, I could even write a function, all right, to take all this all this grabbing the new stuff. Well, I, I actually do have a function, I guess, and I could put this in an include file, and I could call it. And in and for different cases, I could format it however I wanted to. Do you have a question or? Okay. Let's go and see our latest iteration of this. You didn't complete the div tag. Oh, I didn't? The first part of it. Oh, the di tag. All right. So there, that's formatted. 
And does it give you a certain amount? Or is it like an infinite? Does it give you a certain amount? Um, the yeah, the results. Uh, yeah, it does not give you like, like infinite. Um, typically, um, I believe it, it, is, it is the person that maintains the RSS feed, the code that maintains it, specifies like how much data it's going to keep. Output. Output, yeah. Like, for example, I know like in blog feeds, it's usually like maybe 25 entries. You know, it's not like, it's not like an infinite number of entries. It's, it's going to be uh, discrete. Um, not sure if you can, there might actually be a parameter that you could set when you make the request. I guess it depends on who's creating that RSS feed. Actually, I feel like such a Uh, not that it matters exactly how this looks, but I would probably do something like this. I don't think I need this stuff in parentheses. That's, there you go. And actually, if I'm going to do that, Yeah, that's how I like it. All right, very neatly formatted again. But again, you know, and I do this partly just because, you know, my personality just like it wasn't liking it and I had to complete it the way I wanted it. All right, but partly to illustrate the whole concept of the fact that we have the, the, the contents coming from one place, we're formatting that however we want, and, and we have the power to do that without upsetting or messing up. Um, where the data comes from. All right. Now, what does this mean if you want to incorporate other stuff? Like if you want to incorporate weather or whatever. Well, if you went out and did like a search for PHP weather plugin or something along that, you could probably find, but you're going to have to find what it expects. All right. Because in this case, it was pretty straightforward. We found that for this to work, we simply need to, to supply a search parameter for whatever we're looking for. All right, so whether it be climate change or whether it be Cleveland, Ohio, or whatever. We just had to supply that and plop it in there and the rest works. A lot of the weather um, things that I found actually looked uh, or wanted latitude and longitude. All right. So nice thing is, is if I'm not mistaken, we actually have that in the geolocation. So we would simply be using those variables then when we formatted our request. So we'd have to see how that request gets formatted. All right. So if you're going to do this, like the, the one assignment is to go and incorporate some different feature for this. See if you can find like a weather plug-in or something like that. What would you need to change about this code? Well, you'd have to figure out, first of all, how the request to the server needs to be formatted. And again, it might require the latitude and longitude. The good news is, is that, again, that's available through the GL plugin. So you have to format that. You're going to have to find what it outputs. Now, if you hit the jackpot and it outputs an RSS feed, you got a lot of that code right here. If it formats it in some other mechanism, though, you're going to have to figure out what the tags are in there. More than likely, you will be getting XML from this, but that's not a guarantee. 
All right. So you'll have to, if you did get an RSS feed, you have the code sort of to pluck out the pieces that seem relevant. And then you have to decide how you want to format it. And that would be along the lines of this piece of code. Now, what is the difference between this and AJAX? I, I want to briefly talk about AJAX and we'll, we'll, we'll hit it harder next time. Maybe we'll, we'll AJAXify this guy. All right. What's the difference between this and AJAX? The way this works is, let's imagine for a second, by the way, that we didn't have... Um, we didn't have uh, geolocation in this. We had a drop down where you could pick your city and it ran out and did a search. All right. This code right here is running on a web server. And the web server is doing two jobs. Right? It is going out to the service, getting the results XML and then formatting it. Now the implication of this is when you go to the server in a traditional web application you're redrawing the whole page. Alright, so If we were to have a form here that had a drop down for the city, let's say, instead of the geolocation, and we had a search button, we pick our city, click the search button, that submits to the server, and let's say it goes and it redraws the whole page with the drop down and the button and then it shows for Cleveland the news and if I then change it to Illyria click the button it would go to the server get all this and redraw the whole page again now depending on the kind of page you have redrawing the whole page could be a big deal alright with Ajax we separate the two functions and we let the client do what the client's good at and we let the server do what the server's good at. Server is good about handling and delivering big pieces of data. The client is good about formatting web pages. Through JavaScript we can change the way a web page looks. The client's also responsible, uh, the client's also good at making requests. And the idea is in an AJAX application, what we're going to do is the client is going to make the request to the server to get some XML or maybe some other kind of data. It doesn't have to be XML. The server isn't going to produce an entire web page. The server is going to return back to the client a piece of data. In this case, it might return that XML file that uh, was created. Then the client is going to have code to format the content. So. The client is going to make the request. The server is going to obtain and return data slash content. And the client is going to format that. To, to see a good example of AJAX, 
we can simply do a Google search. I, I've uploaded this example already. I'm not going to upload my changes to it. Oh, maybe I'll, I'll, I will upload my changes to it. Because I think it's cleaner code. I go and I start typing in P H P. Let's think about what's going on here. Whoops. We don't know what's going on here because we can't see. All right. P H P. What's going on here? All right. I'm interacting with the client, right? I'm interacting with the web page. I'm not clicking on a link or clicking a submit button. I'm just typing in. All right. But clearly, that data is probably coming from a web server because this web page, my client, doesn't have all these possible search terms in it. Right? This is coming from Google's database. All right? But notice how the entire page doesn't refresh. Typically when you request a page from the server, the entire page requests. So what's happening really is, as I am typing, the client is making a request to Google server for give me the top several search terms that start with these characters. Looks like it's giving me four of them. Why doesn't it give unlimited? Why does it take too long? Right? The whole key to this is that it happens quickly and intuitively. So as I type in, I get the top four results for what I've typed in. I press a key. The client sends a request to Google server that says, give me the top four search terms. Google returns those. The client then alters the page to contain those. So it's a little dance between the client and server that's a little more sophisticated than the typical I'm going to request a complete page, you're going to give me back a complete page. Instead, this web page says, give me some data. Google then returns that data, and the client can then alter it with that new content without having to refresh the whole page. So this makes applications look a lot smoother, a lot more like applications as opposed to websites where the traditional website is clunky. Every time you do something, you refresh the whole page. Now, before we finish this up, because we'll go into the mechanics of this more uh, in detail um, in next class, but why is this so neat for mobile development? Well, let's think about this. What, am I, what do I need to do phone gap build? To, need, to do phone gap build, I can only do it with HTML pages. Can't do it with PHP pages. All right. I can create a client that is just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that makes AJAX requests to a web server and have a set of scripts running on a web server I can then take that HTML5 client, do a phone gap build on it, have a native app that is a native app, looks like a native app, acts like a native app, and uses the PHP scripts running on the server to supply it data. All right. So Ajax comes in handy there where to build a client or to build a native app, using PhoneGap build, we're restricted to just HTML stuff. Well, that's not a problem if those HTML scripts are making PHP calls out to a server. All right? Which, you know, although I haven't necessarily done it myself, certainly I don't see any problem with that. All right? Questions at this point? What we'll do on Monday is we'll spend a little bit of time talking about Ajax to sort of um, sort of close the loop, and then Wednesday will be a work day. All right, questions.